guys, it's Miss Sarah, and we're continuing the story, The Dreadful Fate of Jonathan York. Where we last left off, everyone else that he was traveling with had told their story so they could stay at the hotel. Mr. York still hasn't come up with this, so let's see what happens. Finally, the old man removed his pipe from his mouth. So, he said, his voice sounded deeper than before, amplified. Let's hear your story. Mr. York licked his lips and ran his hand through his hair, which he noted was starting to recede. He was desperate to stall for even a few more seconds, but in the end, it was useless. The old man's eyes were pouring into him. He had no story to tell. I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but I have no story to tell you. Mr. York tried to maintain eye contact with his host, but he felt his gaze slipping down to his hands, which were squirming below the table. What do you mean? asked the old man. His voice was low and steady, like a carnivore preparing to ambush its prey. I mean, I can't think of a story worth telling. I've led a rather dull life, I suppose. Balderdash, snapped the old man. Surely you can think of something worth sharing. Those three yo-yos manage. The first two told stories and first for crikey's sake. Mr. York's mind gave a last attempt to scrounge up a story, a humorous antidote, a whimsical fable, a fairy tale, a limerick, even a nursery rhyme might suffice, but nothing. Mr. York could think of nothing to satisfy the old man. I'm sorry, Mr. York repeated. I've never had any true adventures of my own, you see, and I've never given it much thought at that. Perhaps if you'll give me a room, I'll think of a story as I sleep, or I can make one up overnight. Hogbosh, bellowed the old man. The deal is no story, no room. As long as I'm alive, that rule stays. Now make up a story or get out of my house as he punctuated his ultimatum by pounding his fist on the table. The old lady appeared in the doorway and Mr. York turned to her, hoping for sympathy. He found none. The kindness had left her eyes. Now they just looked beady. She shook her head and turned away. You know, I think you really do have a story to tell, but you just don't want to share it with a scraggly old man like me, growled the old man. You think you're too good for me, don't you? No, Mr. York gasped. That's not true. Then tell your story or get out. Mr. York, York's jaw slumped. He stared bug-eyed at the old man, unable to speak or think clearly. Finally, he mustered enough sense to hobble from the kitchen, stumble at the front door, and trudge back into the gloom of the swamp. The rain had softened and misting, but the air was damp and seemed heavy in Mr. York's lungs as he walked the same trail he traveled only a short, short while earlier. The scene felt unreal, and the more he wondered if he might actually be home in bed dreaming. It wasn't. Gradually, his wits returned to him, and with them came pangs of panic. There will be another house, he assured himself. The old man and old lady couldn't be all out here alone. There will be others, maybe a town. Keep your head up, you'll get by. Perhaps you'll even laugh about it all, th all this tomorrow. But deep down, Mr. York had his doubts. With each passing minute, he was more and more certain he would never make it out of the swamp. He tried to recall the old lady's warning. What did she say? Lacerating manti? Schwather gulks? Preposterous. She was crazy, the old man too both crazy. Still, this logic was little comfort. He plodded along, giving little or no th thought to the direction in which he was moving. Every now and then he scanned the swamp for house lights. He saw none, and it seemed the swamp was growing denser. All of a sudden, a rustling jerked him from his stupor. He swirled around with eyes bulging with fear. Who's there? He shouted. No answer. He peered into the swamp into the shadows. Someone's there. I heard you. Show yourself. Please. An excruciating pause. 
and then a gravelly voice. Relax, Slim. Call off your hounds. It's only me. A short hunch figure appeared in the path. He was clad in a ratty jacket, two sizes too big, and a beat-up pork pie hat. His hair was unkempt, his, bree his beard scruffy, his nose long and cumbered. His eyebrows were untamed as Luna Moth antenna, and below them a pair of yellow eyes glowed like queasy stars. The little fellow tipped his hat. No cause for alarm. It's just me, C. Percival Trellis, at your service. Now tell me, Spring Ring, what's a soft fry like you doing out at a brutal hour like this in a rotten place such as here? I'm Jonathan York, and I'm lost. Perhaps do you know a way out of the swamp? The little fellow grinned. Certainly I do. I'm a bona fide regular around dense parts. See, cause it would be take a better part of the night to get out. And it's always risky to travel after dark. You'd be better off burning down in a safe house for a spell most of y'all. Then do you know a place I can spend the night? The little fellow's grin whined. Mayhaps I do, Mr. York. Cause from being from out of town, I suspect you ain't Oh, proper swamp lion protocol now, is ya? Mr. York shrugged. I'm saying it's good and proper manners for an outsider to humor the locals with a token tip, especially when they ask in favors. I'm sorry, Mr. Trellis, but I don't have any money. The little fellow chuckled. Don't take it. Just the wrong way to York it, but I think I knows a lie when I see one. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. York turned his pockets out, spilling some lint, a frayed piece of dental floss, and an old bottle cap. The little fellow scooped up the bottle cap and polished his on his sleeve. He opened up the side of his jacket, revealing an assortment of trinkets hiding from the lining. Better than nothing, I suppose, he muttered as he tucked the bottle cap in a pouch. All right, you have your tip, said Mr. York. Please tell me where I might spend the night. Right, right. The little fellow's grin had grown so wide it threatened us for the top of his head. About a quarter mile down the path and off to the left, there's an old whistle tree. Amid the whipples, you'll find a door with a brass knocker. Knock three times fast, three times slow. Three times fast, three times slow. You got it. Do that and you'll find yourself a place to spend the night. With that, the little fellow tipped his hat again, slipped into the shadows. Mr. York reset his pockets, moved on, hoping his instincts were wrong, and Mr. Percival Trellis had told it true. He walked another ten minutes before he saw the whistle tree. It loomed high in the night, in the sky, its limbs curling and twisting like the tentacles of some terrestrial cephalopod. He ran his hands along the tangled vines until they find, found a small wooden door, the brass knocker, just as the fellow had described. He clutched the knocker, paused at the shock of cold metal against his skin, and delivered three quick knocks, followed by three slow ones. Silence. He fidgeted, wondering if he had somehow done the knocks wrong. Just when he became convinced that he had been cheated out of a bottle cap, the round opened beneath his feet before he had time to shout, scream, or even eat. Poor Mr. York was plunged into darkness. And that's where we'll stop for this time. Man, it's getting pretty crazy. Let's see who Mr. York runs into next week. All right, guys, have a good one.